Like many young adolescents, Welcome Vidboy was faced with the challenges and pressures of wanting to belong. Growing up without a father in Valhalla Park in the Cape Flats, he was met with the opportunity to receive the attention and acknowledgement he yearned for, and he took it. A young man with ample potential and some difficult choices to make. This is his story. This is my story. Um, thank you so much, Wayne, for that uh, beautiful introduction. Um, good evening, men. Um, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so happy to be here this morning, uh, this evening. Um, yeah, you know, when you, when you have been planning and you've been thinking about what to say, and I'm trusting that God is going to put on my heart the, a message that I want to bring to you, um, and through my testimony, be able to just give you a piece of my life and let you know how awesome God is and how amazing he can just do things that none of us can ever think is possible. Um, you know, when, when, when we were building up to, to this day, um, I, had a, I had a great opportunity to meet with the men, Wayne and, and, and the team, and we were talking about how um, best, not just to bring this message across, but how best to allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does. You know, sometimes we, we, we might be talkers, we might be speakers, we might be motivational speakers, but God says that, you know what, sometimes you just need to park that and let me do the work through you. And, and we need to be those vessels who say that God must let that happen. And I'm here not just to tell you about my story and not just to preach or not to testify, but I'm here to make you understand that no matter where you are in your life, God is present. And not just present, but is also available. And that is where my story starts. Growing up in a beautiful place called Vahala Park on the outskirts of the Western Cape. Very gang-infested community. And I had a father, but my father was not present. He was available, but he wasn't present. You know those fathers that used to work a lot? I don't know how many of these men here can just, if you raise your hand, you know you work so much. You know your, your son, your daughters, they just see a little bit of you. They don't see all of you. Hmm? Spend so little time with them. My father was that type of man. He never spent time with me. That is why today I don't even watch rugby. I see men wearing the boca here, and I'm like, okay, I see it, I see it. I don't understand the analogy of 11 men chasing after that oval ball, but it's fine. You know, so, um, because I, I had an absent father. <laughs> so, um, and growing up in that environment where I actually really needed him. You know, um, let's face it, men, boys need their fathers. And um, my father wasn't, he wasn't present. And as I was growing up without a father, um, I used to remember that the best times that I used to really have a connection with my father is when I did something wrong. You know, when I break a plate or I don't do my chores and my mom would complain to him and then all of a sudden my dad would sit me down and he would have a conversation with me. You know, on my face I would act as if I'm so sad at what I did. But in my heart, I used to rejoice because I'm finally having a conversation with my dad. He sees me. He's speaking to me. He's talking to me. And uh, needless to say, I, I continued breaking plates. <laughs> I continued missing my chores because I loved those moments with him. And I remember the time when, when I was coming from school one day and I was on my way uh, to the house. Um, they, I lived in this community, and I used to wear this blazer. Uh, there's a school in, in the Western Cape, uh, in Cape Town, actually in Athlone, um, which is called Athlone um, High School. And I was at Spesbona High School, and I was a straight-A student. I was very smart. I used to wear my blazer. I used to get off the bus, you know, and my grandmother would be waiting for me because she would accompany me home because, you know, when I used to walk from the bus stop to the house, boys used to make fun of me. They used to tease me. They used to call me mommy's boy, used to call me a sissy because I wasn't part of what was going on in the community. I was always in the house. I was always just going to school. I was a good boy, you know, uh, set aside breaking the plates and not doing my chores. But other than that, I was a very good boy. So, but these boys in the street used to see me going just from the house to school. And I used to wear this blaze and they used to make fun of me. They used to tease me, they used to bully me. I remember one day me and my grandmother, we walked to the shop and there were these boys on the corner their, their, their pants were hanging low, you know, and they spoke a very different language. And they used to bully people into giving them money. It's like, hey, 
And I'm like, what the hell? You know, these people like just bully these people into giving them money. And what I did not understand, like as I was walking on the streets and I saw these boys on the corner, I saw the girls. The girls were crazy about these boys. Crazy. And I'm like, yeah, I'm walking with my blazer. I'm a very neat boy. But the girls are not looking at me. I was like, what's wrong with me? You know, their pants are hanging low. Their language is different. And I was like, you know what? These girls love bad boys. And I'm not a bad boy, you know? And, I, and, and somehow in me, seeing that every single day, I kind of like envied these boys. I wanted to be like them. I was wondering what it would be like to move out of this safe zone that I was in, this cocoon that I was staying, that my grandmother used to say, welcome, you go to church, you go to Sunday school, and you come back home. In the week, you go to school, you come home. And as I was starting to understand what was going on, I used to envy these boys standing on the corners doing their thing. I wanted to be like them because I saw that being me wasn't working out. I don't know how many of you can raise your hands and say, like, you know, sometimes when you go to work, you, 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 you stick out like a sore thumb. Nobody wants to speak to you. Nobody wants to associate with you because you are different. You are so different. I was so different. And as I was there, being that different. I remember one day I was coming from school and my grandmother wasn't with me. I was, I was approached. And these men said, you know what, we saw you. We can see how you envy us, how you want to be like us. But don't worry, there's room for more. Join us. Be part of us. I didn't know what I was joining. I was like, okay, no problem, I can do this. I mean, they're talking to me, that's a start. And I started walking with them, sitting with them, learning from them. And the more I was sitting with them and the more I was learning from them, I realized that I was now part of a gang. And the more I was part of this gang, it was funny because now what happened is that I started to lie. When my grandmother used to ask me, welcome, where were you? I would say, no, I was helping a friend of mine do his homework. And my grandmother believed me. My mother and my father didn't actually care because they, they trusted, they trusted that welcome is doing the right thing. Because when the report came, I still did well. And as I was learning from them, the night staying away from home became longer. I started coming home very late. Now I was starting to learn, they were starting to teach me how to rob, how to steal, how to take from people what did not belong to me. I remember one day these guys said, listen, we're going to go to this place up in Durbanville and we're going to go break into houses, but we're going to show you how it's done. So they gave me this amazing task. They said, your job, welcome, is to bring back a TV. You know, you have to bring back a TV. Now, needless to say, I'm not going to give away my age. You just need to guess. I'm very, very old, though. You know, when you, when you, when you walk in faith and you walk with Christ, it keeps you young. It's like an elixir. You know, it just keeps you young. You look young. But I've been around. And they give me this task. They say to me, your job is to bring back a television. I remember this house had this fence. So we jumped over this fence. And there was the sliding door. So for those of you that are sitting here that have been broken into, now you know how the sliding door works, right? I'll tell you. So they started, they showed me how you lift the sliding, the sliding door from that line. And then once it's off that line, you just push it back and it's broken and you just go in. Irrespective of whether it's locked or not. And we came into this house and we saw this TV and I said, that's your task. And I had this, and I was like this short guy and I was like this TV. So, and it's not the flat screens, guys. That time there was no flat screens. So now you know how old I am, ne? no flat screens. It was that TV that had that big behind, huge. And I was like, hey, how am I going to carry this TV? Because now we have to jump the fence again. And as I was carrying this TV on my own, because Yalka man for himself. Every man for himself. That's the law. In the of Nigga Sebenzelela. I queen to those of Sebenzel. Of Nigga Sebenzel. Okay, that's closer for every man for himself. So now as I'm carrying this TV and I'm walking towards the fence and I'm thinking to myself, I need to put this TV on this wall. So I look around and I see there's a bin. I take the bin, I pull it closer, I put the TV on the bin, I get on top of the bin, I stand on the bin, I take the TV, I put it on the fence. Now I have to get over the fence. But the fact is there's no bin on the other side, so I don't know how this is going to work. But this is my task. And if I can bring back this TV, these boys, these men, they will accept me. 
they will honor me. They will rejoice in the fact that I am part of them. And as I put this TV on the wall and I'm about to get over, I try to do this backflip because I want to jump over the wall so that I can catch the TV on the other side. My foot hits the TV and there it goes. Breaks. So the TV is literally broken. So I'm like, but I cannot go back without a TV. So I take the frame with me. You know, I take the frame with me. I say, guys, I tried. I tried. I take the frame with me. I say to them, here's the frame. I at least tried, but the TV broke. They looked at me and they said, you know what? Let's continue. I was 12 years old when I joined the gangs. I started growing while I was in the gangs. Welcome was no longer accepted as just being welcome because that's my name. Funny enough, <laughs> welcome is my name. So you see a guy who's a gangster comes towards you, he's like, oh, here, welcome comes. Are you going to run? Never. You're going to feel welcomed. <laughs> so they said, no, welcome, we can't do this. We need to change your name. We need to change your name. Man, this is where I want you to understand how sly the devil is, how cunning the devil is. There's power in your name. There's relevance in your name. And these men come together, they decide they're going to change my name. And they called me Dynamite. I'm no longer welcome. I mean, it makes sense. You come Dynamite, you're going to run. Because Dynamites are explosives. You're going to run. Another plan of the devil is that he takes your name and he gives you another name so that you can fit in with the rest of his crew. And he takes the name that God has given you and he says, hide that name. It's not important here. Hide that name. Because if you operate with your God-given name, you do wonders. You do miracles. You perform great things with your name because it's God-given. So he takes that away from you. So right now I'm known as Dynamite. And as I'm walking in the streets, the girls also look at me and they start fainting because you come dynamite. <laughs> now I'm also, part of the, I'm also part of the gang and I'm also very, now, now you know what, I'm in. So now the girls are starting to look at me. They're starting to ad ad admire me. They're starting to walk beside me. They just want to be with me. It felt good because you are with dynamite. It's an explosive relationship, this explosive and as I start operating as this, I start getting more deeper and deeper into these gang activities. So now we have to rob people. And as we are starting to rob people, you know, you take these old ladies that come to the shop, they've got all of these grocery bags, you pretend to be helping and then you run away with her bags. You know, you do all of these stupid things. Boys and girls are coming from school, you rob them. You take their shoes, you take their bags, you take whatever because you just want to be the man. So people don't respect you, they now fear you. Now you are a menace. My second name is actually Dennis. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, I'm this menace in this community. But I think it's the cool thing because everybody just loves welcome. But it's not love, it's that fear. At the age of 16, I remember being called and they said to me, you need to come to the house. We all have a meeting. The gangs have a meeting. And I'm invited to this meeting. They said, it's your big day. I've been part of the gangs since the age of 12. Imagine, since the age of 12. And now that I'm 16 years old, now they're only going to officially recognize me as a member of the gang. What was I doing all those years? I come into the circle and there's a circle of men. And they invite me into the circle. They say, well, I'm standing in the middle of the circle. I'm standing in the middle of the circle. This man comes to me, says, we've been watching you. We've seen your potential. We've seen how amazing you are. We've seen how quick you learn. And today we want to make you a full-fledged member of our gang. And he hands me over this piece of cloth. And as I take this piece of cloth in the midst of all of these men in the circle, I feel honored. And he hands me this piece of cloth. And as I open this piece of cloth, it's a Snap Nose 38 special with eight bullets on the side. He says to me, this is your license. This is your identity. 
But in order to claim this identity, you need to take a life. You need to take a life. It was kids' play up until that moment. Taking a lady's groceries, taking a person's tackies or shoes, jumping over a fence and stealing a TV, those, that's kids' play. What these men are now asking me to do is to take another person's life so that I can finally be part of this gang. There's this part of me that is not in agreement, but there's another part of me that's in agreement. This part of me that says, welcome, if you do this, you will be worthy. Welcome, if you do this, you will be accepted. Welcome, if you do this, you will be loved. You will be liked. You will belong somewhere. You will be someone. You will be revered if you do this. Another part of me says, welcome, if you do this, you will lose who you are. Because taking a life is not easy. The strategy to taking this life it's very simple to these men. They say, welcome. You know, the, the approach is very simple. Tomorrow evening when you come here, we will train you how to use your firearm. We will teach you how to use it, how to load it, how to point it. But the minute you pull that trigger, it requires you to give a willingness that you're going to take a life. And once you do that, you will be part of us. They say we're going to drive around and we're going to look for a victim. And we'll point out the person that we want you to take. And once you've shot that person, just get back in the car and we will go. The next day we went to a place in Durbanville, driving around. And they pointed to a few people, jokingly, and said, no, we're just joking, not them. So we came to this place. It was at the Durbanville train station and a lady was walking out of the train station towards her car, they stopped, they said, that's your target. As I got out of the car, pulled back the trigger, I stood between this woman and myself and I looked at her and she looked at me. And as I pointed my gun to her, she held her stomach and she said, please do not shoot, I am pregnant. Please do not shoot. I am pregnant. And at that moment, I realized that if I'm going to shoot this woman, I'm going to kill two people. I had two choices that I had to make. The first choice was, if I do not shoot this woman, I do not know what these men are going to do to me. But it's clear it's not going to be a good thing. And as I'm standing there, and I'm looking at this woman and she's begging for me not to shoot. I don't know what to do. I'm standing there, I'm saying, I don't know what to do. I'm speaking to myself. A part of me wants to pull the trigger because it's important that I do it because I want to be part of this gang. I ask this woman, get into your car. I tell her, get into your car. And I say to these men, we will follow you because I can't do it here. We get into a car and we drive. And as we are driving and following the men in front of us, I'm thinking a lot of things. I'm thinking about the fact that she's, a, she's going to be a mother. I'm thinking about my mother. I'm thinking about my own life. And I'm thinking about if I do this, what's going to happen to me? And as we are driving, we're standing at Four Trekker Road in Belleville. And as we are standing there, there's already police vans patrolling the area because they've already been notified of something that had happened at a train station, so they were very quick to identify the situation. And as we are standing at the robots, I say to this woman, you know what, if you go with me to this place that we are going to, which is in Vahala Park, I'm sure that these men will do far worse to you. So jump out of the car, run into any shop, and I'll just pretend as if I'm chasing you. And I did that. She jumped out of the car and I pretended. I had my gun in my hand and this guy comes to me and says, welcome, shoot. I said, I can't shoot her. You have a gun, why don't you shoot her? So now we are arguing in the middle of the road. 
And at that moment, the police have already closed down and we get all, all of us get arrested. So as we're all arrested, we're bundled into this police van and we're sitting in the back, seven of us. These men say to me, welcome. You know that you messed up. And because you messed up, you need to take this case. You need to go to court and you need to tell the judge that we are not part of this. If you don't do that, we will make your life a living hell. But if you do this, we will take care of you and your family. We will make sure that if you do go to prison, which you will not go because you are 16 and you are still underage, you'll just get a warning. So as we go, we go to the police holding cells. We are there for a few days. We stand in front of the judge. I say to the judge, Your Honor, I do not know these men. The judge says, welcome, are you serious? I say, yes, I am. They said, okay, cool, men, you can stand down. Those men then go. But before these men go, they said that they will take care of my family. And if I, do get to pr if I do go to prison, I will not be there for a very long time. And if I'm there, they're going to look after me. They'll make sure that I have everything that I need, the promises that they normally make. And as I'm sitting in that holding cell, being transported back, I think about my life and I'm thinking about the fact that, you know what, I'm not going to go to prison because yes, I'm young, I'm 16. This is my first offense. The judge will look kindly on me and give me a second chance. I remember those days if it was yesterday. On the 21st of November, 1999, I'm called and I'm standing at Belleville High Court and the judge tells me, well, come stand up. I stand up and he says, today I'm going to sentence you. I was 17 years old when the judge sentenced me. I looked at the judge, he looked at me, and he said, because of your stupidity and because of the seriousness of your crime, I'm sentencing you to 23 years in prison. Now imagine, my father was not in court my mother was not there, only my grandmother. And my grandmother started to cry and she started to scream because she could not believe it. I could not believe that the judge had just handed me down 23 years. I remember going down into the hole where they keep offenders that need to be transported to a prison. And the men there were making fun and telling me that by the time I come out of prison, cars will be flying. 23 years probably watch too much Back to the Future, but it's fine. I was in the holding cell and I sat there and I said to myself, imagine 23 years, but that's nothing. They sent me to one of the most five deadliest prisons in the world, Paulsmo. Paulsmo is one of the five most deadliest prisons in the world. And as I entered that prison, Imagine going into Paul's more 17-year-old, scrawny boy from the Cape Flats. And according to the law, the correctional officers must show me where I'm going to sleep. They must literally assign me a bed and say to me, this is your bed. But this is South Africa, it doesn't work like that. In South Africa, you get pushed into the cell and you must sin and come clear. You must work it out. And as I'm being pushed into the cell, I'm standing in front. There's another guy that came with me into the cell and he's standing next to me. They ask me, two men come to me. They ask me, who are you in prison? I'm like, I'm welcome. Oh, that guy slapped me so hard. Oh, you have been slapped and you just hear that zing in your ear. The guy asks me, who are you in prison? I'm like, I'm welcome, and he slaps me again. The guy next to me, they ask him, who are you in prison? He answers, Franz van Chonalanga. And nothing happens to him. I'm like, okay, I'll say that. <laughs> so the guy comes back to me and asks me, who are you in prison? I'm like, Franz van Chonalanga. And then nothing happened. I'm like, oh, so that's the key word here. 
But as I said, Franz van Jonalanga, I did not know that I was agreeing to become part of the prison numbers gang, which is the 28s. So there's three gangs in prison, the 26s, 27s, and 28s. 26s and 27s are known as Mpumalanga, where the sun comes up. The 28s are known as Nchonalanga, where the sun goes down. And what this guy said was the sun goes down, which was 28s. And two men were smiling, very happy at the fact that I chose them over the Mpumalangas. And they come and they usher me into the back of the room and they say, we are so happy for the decision that you've made to become part of us. And I'm like, I did not make that decision, but it's fine. <laughs> Who am I to argue? Imagine standing in a room with close to more than a hundred offenders. I don't want to argue about the choice that I just made now as long as I'm going to be safe. There's men sleeping on the right and there's men sleeping on the left. And as I'm starting to learn about prison, I realize that my credentials of being a gangster outside do not work inside. I realize that being a street gangster means nothing in prison because in prison, there's only three gangs, the 26s, 27s, and 28s. And no matter what I was outside, I'm no longer inside. I only have the choice between those three gangs. And if I do not choose these three gangs, I'm choosing to be a France, so let's say an Afrikaans. And a France is a man that nicks Vieti. He can nix. He doesn't know anything. And a France is an easy target because every time something must happen in prison, it starts with him. If men want to sleep with men, it starts with him. If men want to make an example and stab someone, it starts with him. And I realize that I'm not prepared to become all of those things that these men are going to become. So I'm not choosing to be a France. I'm okay with the decision that I've made because I don't yet know what it means or what it implies, but I'm fine. And as these men start telling me about what the 28s represent, I start to get scared because I realize right now I've made a bed and I need to lay in it. And this bed that I've made is not a good bed. As I'm sitting in prison looking at what happens, seeing the men come in, seeing the things that happen to them when they come in because they don't know who they are, seeing how prison abuses them, seeing how the system abuses them, I realize that I cannot be this low level for the rest of my life. A guy comes to me and says, welcome. In order for you to make a statement, in order for these men in prison to respect you, you need to take a life. I'm like, again? God is good. All the time. You know, I'm standing there and I'm saying to myself, so the devil failed in the beginning and is bringing back that same task again. And I'm standing there and I'm saying to myself, God, I don't know what to do. I'm not a praying man. I don't talk to God. I think that God was so far from me that time. I was like, you know what? I'm in the wilderness here. I'm trying to survive. So God must wait. God must park. My grandmother comes to me every Saturday visiting me. Every time when that bell goes off and they call my number. Because in prison, you know what happens in prison? The same that happened outside. So my name is Welcome. When I was outside in the gangs, they took my name and they called me Dynamite. I came into prison. I get called to the reception. They say, from today on, you are no longer welcome. You are a number. They give me a number. My number was 20016311. That's my number. Imagine. I had to remember that. Because when they call my name for visit, I need to remember. 20016031 visit. And when, my name, when the number is called and I have to go to the visit, whenever I get there, I used to think my friends are here. Those men that promised to come to me, those men that promised to visit me, those men that promised to look after me, to take care of me while I'm in prison. When I get to the visit and I look, it's my grandmother. My grandmother literally took three taxis to get to Paulsmo. Every single Saturday without fail, she used to come to prison. That's the love of a mother. A mother that I never listened to, a grandmother that I never listened to, but she came to me. And every time I sat with my grandmother, she said to me, welcome, we are praying for you. We are praying for your life. We are praying for your safety. We are praying that God makes a miracle and works in your life. I said, ma, this is prison. God does not exist in here. I think he forgot about us. She says, my son, have hope. 
God does not sleep. I say, neither do I. You can't sleep in prison. As this man comes to me, says to me, welcome. In order to be recognized in here, you need to take a life. There was this uh, correctional officer, Mr. Jones, that was a very good friend. I will call him that because he used to talk to me all the time. A correctional officer that just, he was a very loving guy. Very loving guy, Mr. Jones. And he used to come to me and says, welcome. Don't join these gangs in prison. I'm like, mm, too late. He says, don't join these gangs. You're such a bright boy. You can do whatever you, 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 you have potential. I can see it. Don't join these gangs. He used to ask me, what do you want? She said, no, I like sugar. I do. You know, in prison, you get this, in the morning, you get this big bowl of pup, you know, porridge, milly meal. You get this big bowl of porridge, and when you go to the line where they give sugar, they give you like a teaspoon of sugar. And I'm like, how the hell are you going to eat this big bowl of pup with this little bit of sugar? So then you just have to just like maneuver it in such a way you eat a little bit of the pup, but you want the rest of the pup because this is prison. You, you get hungry. And I was like, you know what? Let me exploit Mr. Jones. I want sugar. He used to bring me a bag of brown sugar. Hence, loving brown sugar so much. Mr. Jones used to bring me a bag of brown sugar and extra bread because in the morning you get two slices of brown bread in prison only. Your pup and your two slices of brown bread and coffee. And the coffee tastes like dishwashing liquid. But I was okay. We did wrong. It was our punishment. I was fine with that. But if we could get someone to improve our circumstances just a little bit, we would take that opportunity. You know, you know there's a lot of prison ministries in prison, so if we could wiggle our way into the brother's heart and say, brother, bring a little chocolate there. And then the brother will bring the chocolate and say, amen, hallelujah. We would pretend. Pretend. It's, manipulation in prison is big. Just for that piece of chocolate. And as I was sitting there, and Mr. Jones encouraging me every single time, the gang leader calls me. And in prison, there's only one general. The 28th have a general. And this general calls me and says, welcome. We've decided that you need to go and you need to become a man. You need to stab a correctional officer. But before you do that, we will train you for eight days. Again, the training. Hey, you know what I love? When I talk about this, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to make you understand that the devil's, the devil's plan never changes. It's always the same. It's always the same. The manipulation that he uses is always the same. Now they are training me for eight days on how to stab in the neck between the legs, underneath the armpits, where the main arteries are. Make sure that once you pull that knife, you draw blood, he must die. Because when this correction officer is stabbed and he dies, you get a star. And they tattoo the star on you. They tattoo it. And the funny thing about the tattoo is that they give you the star before you stab. So that there's no way to turn back because it's already on your shoulder, it's tattooed. And if you decide you don't want to do it anymore, they take plastic. No plastic? And they burn it. And they let that plastic drip on that star. And they take steel wool and they rub it off. Never will there ever be a star on that place. Because your skin is literally removed. You will never be found worthy to stab or to climb a rank in prison if you decide to abort your mission. So I remember that evening I was sitting there and this guy came to me and says, come, I need to put your star on you. I was sitting there in agony as this man sat there and he took a staple and he sharpened it in front of me and he said, this is your needle. I'm making your needle now. He took a toothbrush and he burned it at the end and he squeezed that staple into that toothbrush. Now it became a pen. And then he took this uh, soul, and he burned it, and he said, saliva or water? I'm like, water? He says, no problem. He mixed the water with the, with the, with the burned uh, soul, and it became like a powder form and a liquid. And then the guy sat next to me, and he started inking me. It was painful, excruciating pain. And he inked me 
for two, three hours when he was done, he says, your star is there. The general comes and inspects and he says, yes, perfect. Make it a little bit darker there. So the guy goes over it again. Again, another hour of excruciating pain because the general is not happy. The star does not look right. In prison, they have perfectionists, yes. Perfectionists. So as I'm sitting there and I've got my first star, the guy comes to me, he has three blades. He says, I need to choose one. The, the gentleman that told me that I need to stab says, no, don't let him choose. We will choose for him. Let's give him the death blade. We want him to kill this correctional officer that he's going to stab tomorrow. And he's not doing it for himself, he's doing it for us. Because if he, if he stabs and kills this correctional officer tomorrow, he will become part of us. I did not know who this correctional officer is going to be because they don't tell you. So in prison, there's a law. When there's a stabbing that takes place in prison, remember there's the 27s, the 28s, and the 26s. The 26s do not stab. The 26s only make money in prison. God forbid that you ever go there, but if you do go there, meet with the 26s. If you need a blade or sugar, bread, just go to them. They'll organize it for you for cheap. So the 26s operate like that. They get you everything you need. They are the money makers. That is why their sign is the thumb plus the bag of money underneath. And they don't stab. They just do business. The 27s stab, but they only stab during the morning because it's sunned up. When the sun comes up, they go and they stab. That's their purpose. And they are the law keepers. They make sure that the law that has been given to the 26s by the 28s must be upheld. They are like HR. They're like HR. Policies and procedures, they uphold those things. The 28s only stab at night because the sun goes down. So at 4 o'clock, as the clock strikes 4 o'clock and we are standing in the line to have our food, this is welcome's cue. There's two men that will accompany me, and these men are called Drat and Glas. Drat and Glas, wire and glass. Funny terms, ne? But you know what the Drat and Glas means in prison? It means Drat is a person that hears everything. A Glas is a person that sees everything. These two men accompany me. And as they are walking behind me, they've got two purposes. The reason why they're walking with me, they've got two purposes. The first purpose is to make sure that I actually do what I'm saying I'm going to do. And if I don't do what I said I'm going to do, they also have knives. Their purpose is to stab me. So they must kill me for not killing. And if I do kill, their purpose is to take the knife and conceal it because when there's no murder weapon in prison, there's no case. I could be closer to the body, but there's still no murder weapon. Therefore, no added sentence. Their job is simple. I'm, as I'm walking out of the line, the general says to me, Mr. Jones. I'm like, no. This guy has been with me ever since I came to prison. And right now I'm 21 years old. He's been with me every single day, talking to me, encouraging me, motivating me, telling me not to be part of this. And you are asking me to go up there and stab and kill Mr. Jones. I can't. A part of me again, that turmoil, that conflict, fighting within me to say, no, you can't. These two men nudge me. They push me. They say, go. Mr. Jones sees me coming towards him. And because it's welcome, he puts down his hands, no defense whatsoever, and he comes in to hug me. And as he lifts his hands, not holding his baton, I stab him in the neck. And Mr. Jones falls to the floor bleeding. A part of me wants to help, but I can't. Because I know that if I'm going to help him, it's going to be me. As I throw the knife behind me, these two men pick up the knife and they're off. And the correctional officers all come and they push me to the ground and they beat me to a pop and they put me into solitary confinement for three weeks. Three weeks, I was in solitary confinement. My grandmother comes there. They, I can't see her because I'm in solitary confinement. Every single day as I wake up, they take a hose pipe and they water me down. My mattress is wet. My clothes are wet. My food is wet. For three weeks, no lights. 
I'm laying there. A part of me wants to die, but another part of me says, hold on. Three weeks later, they open up my cell. They say, you can go back to population. As they give me a dry set of clothes and I'm standing after I've gone to the orderly, to the medical doctor to go and see if there's anything wrong with me, they say, no, it's fine. They give me my clothes. I walk the line. I go back to the section. I get to my section. I see men on the left and I see men on the right. Hundreds of them. All four of the rooms that are in that cell, in that unit, are standing on attention with their hands held high, saluting me for what I had done, honoring me for having done what I had done, telling me that I've earned my star, respecting me because right now I'm a number one, respected amongst the gangs. I felt good. I felt like, wow, I finally belong. I'm finally seen. I finally belong here, 21 years old. Mr. Jones died three weeks ago. And after that three weeks, I was being exalted as a hero. I was given this rank. Men were honoring me for having taken this life. At the age of 25, I had four stars on both my shoulders. Killing eight correctional officers. And as I started that, men decided that, you know what? We need to be led. And I became the first general of the 28th at the age of 25. Imagine, 25 years old, Two and a half thousand men under my control. I was ruthless. I had no heart. I had no mercy. I was angry. I had my colonels. I had my lieutenants. I had my sergeants. I was respected in prison. I was feared by correctional officers and the heads of prison. I had a reputation. Every single month, like clockwork, Welcome used to make 500,000 rand a month in prison. Drugs, prostitution, solicitation of information, extortion, anything. The 26ers used to go and sell. And whatever they sell under my watch, 75% must come back to the 28s. 25% is theirs. I was a ruthless businessman. So prison operates like that. Prison is a cashless society. So when you are caught with money in prison, it's an offense. And that's why we started buying correctional officers to make sure that once we've made this money, it needs to go out. Outside prison, there's this thing called a council. It's a group of men that have left prison, generals that have left prison, that have started businesses outside, owning clubs, owning factories, lucrative, established businesses. And when they come into prison and they take that 500,000 rand, that money goes into a trust. And when you as a general, you retire, you do not, you do not get anything because you've retired as a general. But if you hold on and you leave prison, your benefits are greater. So from my ratio being who I was and making 500,000 rand a month, every single month like clockwork, my reward if I had to leave prison at that moment was a Mercedes Benz and a club on Long Street and a house in Clifton. That's my retirement plan. That's my benefit. But I'm part of the number. I'm part of the council. I'm still part of the gangs. And the cycle of violence continues. That strategy, that plan that's in place. Two and a half thousand men under my control and I'm ruling prison like it's a well-oiled machine. Prostitution in prison was the biggest, the biggest business. Needless to say, if you were white, 
you cost 1,500 rand a month. Indians cost more. Two and a half thousand rand for an Indian boy, bought by correctional officers or even anybody. It was a business. You get arrested, you don't want to tell the lawyer what you really did. The police, the NPA, they want to prosecute, but you're not telling them what we used to do. We used to, we used to torture you, and you give us all the information, and we just sell the information back to the NPA. They pay us. We're fine. Every little bit of money that is made in prison, I need to know. Because it belongs to me. And men feared me. When the head of prison needs to make a decision, he needs to first ask, welcome, if this decision can be made, because if it's not in welcome's agreement, I will stab your correctional officer just to prove a point. But God is good all the time. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was walking down the corridor. A short man walks by me. He looks at me and he says, welcome, I have a message for you. He says, you know what? All this power that you have, imagine if you could take this leadership, this ability to lead these men and do it positively. Imagine the impact that you will make in their lives. I look at this guy and says, brah, how for me? I have everything that I want here. And as I look at this man, I say, I have everything that I want. But this man persisted. The next day he says to me, I need you to do me a favor, welcome, if you have time. Even the soldiers, my guys that were working, we started pushing him away like, hey, wait, wait, who are you to talk to this guy every single day when you see him? He says, I've got a message. Can I please give it to him? He says to me, can you please do me a favor, welcome. Read Jeremiah 29 verse 11. It says, read Jeremiah 29, verse 11. That evening I come to my room and I'm sitting there and I'm bored because a general's room is never locked. It's always open. I'm in a single cell and I've got everything that I want. My flat screen TV. Yes, finally, a flat screen TV. I'm sitting there and I'm watching this episode. I feel this overwhelming need to just read Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, hey, I'm in. Is these books that they give, these Bibles in prison, it's called Gideon's. Those big Gideon's, New Old Testament, it's there. I'm like, let me take this book, let me go to Jeremiah 29 verse 11 and I start reading. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And I look up and I say, God, you know who I am. Do you know what I've done? Where can you give a man like me a future? Does not make sense. No, you cannot give me a future. I've messed up so much that there is no turning back. At that moment, God starts speaking to me. And he says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet at the end lose your soul? At that moment, I had that strong desire. I fell into God's grace. And I said, God, I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want to do with my life. But it's not going to be easy. In order for the next plan to become successful, I need to believe. And another word comes to mind that says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I'm sitting in the courtyard and as a general, I'm always protected by my colonels and people that want to be like me, that admire me and they're always sitting with me. There's a few boys, a few men sitting in front of me having a conversation about the way they live outside and what they do. These men talk about raping women and they laugh. This one tells the other one, you know what? I wanted a new cell phone. I was tired of this Moby cell. I wanted an iPhone. So I went and I stabbed this guy and I killed him and I took his iPhone. I've got an iPhone now. I upgraded him. 
and they laughed. A thought came to my mind and said to myself, if I were to be a father one day, what kind of father am I going to be? Especially to a girl child. Especially when it comes to men like these and men like myself. What is my daughter going to say if they ask her, please tell us about your father. Tell us about the kind of man your father is. My daughter's words, ah, my father's a gangster. He's the ouruka. He's the man. That's not something that I want to be proud of. My mind went and I started questioning myself and I said, imagine if my daughter brings back a man one day to the house and says, Ma, Dad, I want to introduce you to my boyfriend. And the guy comes into my door and says, Awe time o lekele, ini nyal galamak fo, buka me matambos, they chai zana, blut roi manskap, kusha blut roi manskap, imagine. Speaks like me, has tattoos like me. Because girls normally go out there and get men that assimilate their fathers. I said, no, I don't want that. But God started speaking to me and said, welcome, you know what you need to do. <laughs> this is a very difficult process. I went to the head of prison. I said, Manir, I have a request. He says to me, what's the request? He says, I want to I wanna, I wanna leave the numbers gang. He says, welcome. There's one way in and there's one way out. If you make that request, you might die. And again, the word of God comes to me and says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I need to have total faith in this decision. My journey with God is very, very fragile. I do not have a real relationship with God. So right now, I'm not even trusting my own words as I go to the head of prison. But I'm having this faith that's starting to grow in me. But there's a policy, there's a procedure in place, and this is how it is. If any general decides to leave the numbers gang, there's a process. And the process is called this. Four generals must be taken from four different prisons. And they must be brought to this prison. And in order for that to happen, I need to get permission from the head of prison. And once the head of prison has given permission, he needs to, he needs to tell the area commissioner that Welcome had requested the audience of four generals from four, for four, from four prisons. And that order has to be given on a trip sheet to the Minister of Correctional Services because he has to okay the transportation of four generals from four different prisons. Helderstrom, Breederafir, Worcester, and Caledon. They came. And as these generals landed, a room must be cleaned. Generals do not sleep with other offenders. So these four generals must be in their own room. So as these four generals arrive, they're placed in a room. The head of prison calls and says, welcome, your hearing is next week. Are you ready? I say, yes, I am. The procedure is simple. I need to go to these four generals and I need to ask them for permission to let me go. I'm requesting to retire before my time. The procedure is simple. Four generals. And as you stand in front of these four generals, can I just have four men to make the, 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 the example? Just four, four men. You four look like very eager. Come. <laughs> so we have these four men. Come to the stage. I want to show you. So we've got these four men. They've now decided that they are from four different prisons. All of them are generals. Each prison can have a general. So these, these generals are from four different prisons. They're coming to my prison. So the reason why it's difficult to okay a procedure like this, it is because I might be calling them for one purpose and one purpose only, to maybe take their lives and control their four prisons. So generals are very paranoid. So I cannot go into the circle with these generals wearing any clothes. So I need to enter their circle naked because I can conceal a weapon if I'm wearing clothes. So these four men are standing here. Two of you can stand here, one this side. The other two men, please come this side. Just face them. Yeah, just like that. So this is the process. So the two generals, 
I'm standing in the middle like this. The two generals that are looking at me, these are the judges. Okay, they are the ones that need to hear my reasons for wanting to leave the number. What are the reasons, what are the reasons that I'm going to give them to leave the number? This is the, pro, this is the procedure. The two generals standing behind me are called the executioners. They are the only ones allowed to have knives in this circle. The only ones that are allowed to have knives in this circle. I'm not allowed to have a knife. These two are not allowed to have a knife. Only these two. And the knives must be where? On their right hand. This one must have a knife in this hand. And this one must have a knife in the left hand. Left hand and right hand. If these gentlemen do not agree with the reasons for me leaving the number, their job is simple. They need to stab me simultaneously in my kidneys, twist the knife, pull it out, and I fall and I bleed. Five minutes it will take me to die. But that's nothing. Just check the reward for when I die. The devil is a liar. Check the reward. So as I lay there bleeding, as I lay there bleeding, because I'm a 28, the prison will be on lockdown for eight days. No visits. Offenders will be burning mattresses and blankets and sheets. Prison will be in chaos. But it will be a good chaos. Because the chaos will have welcome's name in it. They will be worshipping and honoring welcome for having fallen for all the right reasons. For eight days they will celebrate me. They will write poems about me for eight days. They will honor me for eight days. And after the eight days is gone, my colonel, my next in line, will just take my position. That's how easily replaceable you are in the devil's kingdom. Eight days of worship. And I'm standing there and I'm saying to these men, gentlemen, I don't want to be part of the number anymore. I am tired. I want to leave. I want to be a father. I want to have a daughter. I want to have a son. I want to be a responsible man. I don't want to look over my shoulders. I want out. I've done a lot. I've given you money. I've given you authority. Look at Paul's He's running like a well-oiled machine. You have everything you need. You don't need me. These men says, no, welcome. We cannot let you go. You've done so much. You are still doing so more. You are doing so much more. What are you going to do if you leave? How are you going to survive? And my word to these men is simple. I say to them that <laughs> if God can take care of the lilies, if God can take care of the birds, he can take care of me. I don't need to be here in order to be taken care of. God will take care of me. I'm fine. These men say, welcome, you are crazy. And I say to them, what does it bother me to have all of this and yet at the end lose my soul? It doesn't make sense. I don't want to lose my soul. If I have to die here tonight, I will die. It's fine. I've made my peace with that, but I want to leave. The general on the right, I don't know if this is my right or your right, he says, welcome. Come one side. Can I just ask you something? He speaks in a way that the others can also hear what he's saying. He says, gentlemen, just give me time with welcome. He says, welcome. You can sit, man. You can go and sit. Thank you. <laughs> this man stands with me and he says, welcome. Do you remember six years ago? Oh. He says, you remember six years ago? I could not read. I could not write. Six years ago, I was at the admissions block and we were coming from another prison and I was sitting there and you passed by and you saw that I was struggling to read this letter that I just received from my family. Six years ago, you took this letter from me and you read the letter to me. You didn't stop there, welcome. You know what you did next? You asked me if I wanted to learn to read and write. He said, you spent three months teaching me to read and write. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Six years later, 
I do not know. I did not know. I would not have known. I would not have planned it. I would not have orchestrated this, but God did. Just, just, just hear me out. God knew that six years later, this man who is standing here will become a general. And six years later, this general will be asked to do something because I did something. But God had already set it in motion. Guys, we are planning, but God is in control. As I'm standing there, this guy says to me, six years ago, you taught me to read and write. Man, I'm not standing here out of my own authority. I'm not standing here because I was ruthless. I'm not standing here because I was being feared. I'm not standing here because I was all powerful in a prison called Paulsmo, ruling two and a half thousand men. I'm standing here because of God's grace. I'm standing here because God had set in motion a plan for man to be taught to read and write one act of kindness. One act of kindness spiraled into a decision that a man has to take when he becomes a general to say, I am returning the favor because you taught me to read and write because that what is what was in God's plan. That was God's plan, not mine. No amount of ruthlessness or killer instinct could save me from this circle. No matter how ruthless I was, if I had not helped this man six years ago, I would not be standing here today. That's the power of God. That's how Jesus Christ operates. When we decide to say, Jesus, take the wheel, and he takes it, and he shows you that if I take the wheel, I'm going to lead you onto a path that's not destructive. Jeremiah 29 will come into full, full effect. It is cast in stone that your life can change. Your life will change. And I will take the sins that you have done, and everything that you've done, and I'll wash you clean, and you will be white. And these men looked at me and they said, because of what you had done, you are free to go. That's why I'm standing here today. Needless to say that I made that decision while I was still in prison. It was a difficult decision to make. But God was with me when I made that decision. The embarrassment, the humiliation of no longer having these ranks or having this power to orchestrate and to do the things that I wanted to do. Imagine walking in a prison where you once controlled two and a half thousand men, but right now you are nothing. You're just one of them walking up and down. Yes, I had my ranks. I was still being respected, but I did not have the authority to command. I did not have the authority to say what needs to happen. I did not have the authority to do anything. That, my brothers, I call surrendering to God completely. It was so beautiful waking up every single morning and just surrendering to God every single day, knowing that this could be my last day on earth, but God said, I will protect you. I will hold you. I will make sure that you leave prison as a complete man. I was bored. Didn't have any power, didn't, couldn't do anything. And this pastor, uh, David Bliss, came back to me. And he said to me, um, let me organize a bursary for you. So you can study. Because you are bored, I can see you are walking up and down aimlessly. I see you reading the Bible, that's nice. But you need to do something else as well. And they got me a bursary to study at UNISA. And I did my teacher's uh, uh, qualification. And as I was going you know, learning and going to the library, le reading and doing all of that. I graduated in 2008. Graduated. And God put it on my heart to say, you know what? You once led these men into this gang. I want you to lead these men into something else. I went to the head of prince and said, your honor, I'm back in your office again because I need a different favor. I want to start a school. Can you please give me an empty cell? <laughs> Head of prison looking at me, empty cell, no problem. I, I don't know where I'll get one, but we'll see. <laughs> Postman is 300% full, and when you want an empty cell, <laughs> we'll see. He said to me, there's this little place in the corner in the kitchen. You can get that. 
I had two offenders that I was teaching to read and write, helping them with mathematics. The class later grew to six. It became 12, 15. I needed help. I said to Pastor Bliss, can we get another bursary for one of these men? He says, no problem. They also got the teacher's qualifications and now it was three teachers. The class grew from 15 to 25. The head of prison says, no, 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 guys, you cannot operate like this. We cannot operate like this. He appointed a correctional officer and said, you oversee this little school project that you have here. Because right now it's a school. The head, of, the, 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 the head of prison then organized with the Department of Education and we registered the school. And then after that, we had 45 students, 15 of which were doing their matric. I had this green uniform. The head of prison said, no, 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 you can't go and teach wearing a prison uniform. He gave me a white shirt and a blue pants. He said, yeah, that's, that's better. Now go and teach. Guys, you understand the power of God here? And I started teaching. And these men that were with me also started teaching. That year, as we were, as we were teaching, the school was registered. We were fully-fledged school. They moved me away from Paulsmo Prison, and they moved me to Branfley. Now we had a, pr a prison on a farm. They gave me a room and said, this is the school. One of these bunkers, this is where you're going to be. I was still a prisoner. And every morning I used to wake up, 8 o'clock, I'm in class, 9 o'clock, the, the offenders are coming, we are teaching. That same year, 100% pass rate. It was even in the newspaper, I even have the newspaper clipping until today, just to show you how awesome God is. 100% pass rate. And it did not stop there. I get a call. I must go to the CMC, which is a case management committee. They say, welcome. The parole board wants to see you. They say, Eish, what now? I sit in front of the parole board. They say, welcome. Eish, brah, the things that you've done in this prison. Oh, hideous. You did A, B, C, D. They bring out every negative thing that I did. Every negative thing. But there was this one report that stood out. My qualification at the University of South Africa. They said, but because of this, we've seen that you are able to change. So in the next two years, you are going home. From the 23 years, I did 14 years in prison. But that's not where it stops. Because God says, he who starts a work in you, he is faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it because he says, because you changed your life in prison, it's not going to stop there. Let's do it outside. Let's see how you're going to survive the pressure outside. Yes, there was pressure. First day I come out of prison. <laughs> Peggy, the first day I come out of prison, nobody wants to give me a job. I used to wear long sleeves because I was hiding my tattoos. I remember going to this interview, being called to this interview. And I've given my CV and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting to be called. As I'm sitting there, they brought me coffee, they brought me water, they were treating me like royalty. It was nice. I sat there and there's people are asking me, welcome, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'm telling them about myself. They go through my CV, they see there's a gap here. 14 years are missing. What happened? 14 years are missing, and prisons have changed, guys. Remember, it was prisons when I went to prison. It was, it was Posmo Gefangenis, Posmo Prison. Then it became Posmo Correctional Center. And just before I left, it became Center of Excellence. So I said to them, no, I was at the Center of Excellence. <laughs> prison is out. I was at the Center of Excellence. They say, wow, can we verify I'm like, ish. <laughs> yeah, verify. So the lady walks out, and I can hear her like I'm hearing her now with those who scoop, 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 scoop out. She had a pace. You know, she was calm when she left. 
Oh, when she came back, and then she whispered into this guy's ear. And I saw this guy looking at me, and he looked at me. You know that look of judgment? And he says, uh, uh, Mr. Vidboy, don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get the job. And as I was walking out of there, hopeless because now I didn't get the job, I was standing outside. Imagine this. I'm standing there outside now. I'm passing a Shell Garage. There's a cash and transit van standing there. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at this van. I'm saying, oh, two men. We can take the front and then I get two guns and we take the back. Yeah, it's a, this is easy six-man job. We can pull it off. Maybe we'll make a few million and then I can just, you know. The mind started working. You know, where, where you want to go back to what you know. Where you're, 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 because you are no longer in a position where you feel like I can. You know, when you lose faith in God, you start questioning his plan. And when you start questioning his plan, the devil puts ideas into your head. And as I'm standing there, I get home. My grandmother says, uh, Father Baby Chan was here looking for you. I'm like, okay, cool. Let me call him. I call Father Baby Chan. He says, welcome. I've got a job for you. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Cash and transit van. Bye-bye. I go to Pinelands and I got this job to do admin. So as I'm starting to do admin, I'm starting to work in prison, in prison ministry. Now I'm the one that registers the guys going into the prison services. I'm making name tags. I'm doing all of this and I'm getting paid for this. And it was a nice job. I loved it. And then this one lady comes from the Sonke Gender Justice Network and she says, welcome. Uh, we're starting a prison project in our company. Big human rights organization. We would like you to be part of it. I'm like, me, part of that? Okay. God gave me a job. Now I'm working at Sonke Gender Justice Network. I remember that day I was signing my contract to become part of the team. God started making changes in my life, operating and working in my life. God took me from darkness and he put me into the light. And as I was working for Sonke Gender Justice Network, I started meeting people, operating meeting people, talking to people, getting to know people. I remember there's a team from Difford in the UK that came to South Africa, they needed a chaperone. They said, welcome because you know Cape Town, can you please take them around? And I started taking them around and showing them the area and showing them what's happening. They started asking questions. They loved what I did. And that same year, Roland Joffe was shooting a movie called The Forgiven. And he said, Eric Banner and Forrest Whitting will be part of this movie. Maybe welcome, you can come and advise them on how things work in prison. I was like, yeah, no problem. They said, we'll pay you. I said, cool. I remember going there and I'm showing these men and I'm talking about prison. Eric Banner steps into the room. You know Eric Banner? Uh, King Arthur. Um, he's Hannah's father in one of these. He's an Australian actor. You know, Forrest Whitaker with the eye, the eye that keeps twitching. He comes into the room. I look at them. They look at me. I'm like, wow, Hollywood stars, Baba. <laughs> I, don't, I can't believe this. Roland says, welcome. I've been thinking about this. Why don't you act in this movie? I'm like, me, act. <laughs> don't ask me twice. <laughs> don't ask me twice. What do you want me to do? <laughs> says, play a gangster. I'm like, ah. Oh. Play a gangster, but God is good all the time. We went back to prison. When we were shooting this movie, we shot it on location. Guess where this prison was? Paul's Mo Prison. <laughs> Guess the room, room 626, where I was sleeping. That very same room where I was slept. God took me back. He said, let me remind you of where I took you out. I remember that day, it was yesterday. Eric Banner stands next to me. I'm teaching him to swear, <laughs> number one, because he kept saying push instead of the other word. 
I'm teaching him to speak Afrikaans because he's acting as an Afrikaans, Afrikaner prisoner. Forrest Whitaker is playing Desmond Tutu, and I'm playing a gangster. So as we're standing in the cell, I just get this overwhelming feeling coming over me, and I start to cry. Eric Banner looks at me and says, can we please just give welcome, but in his accent, can we please just give welcome a minute? I just wept because I was back in that same room where everything happened and started for me. I was brought back as a, rem as a, re as a reminder. God was reminding me of saying that you're never going to go back to prison as a prisoner. You're going to go back to prison as a conqueror. You've overcome this place. <laughs> Sitting in this room, and we acted, and we did everything we did, and the movie came out. It was amazing. For those of you that want to watch it, it's a beautiful movie. It's, a beautiful, it's called The Forgiven. It's a movie about forgiveness. And as I was playing in this movie, there's a lot of stuff that also came up for me, especially the part of forgiveness. And I was part of this program called Restorative Justice, where I was being taught about forgiveness. So I knew that my next journey, in order to open up a, a bigger gate and a bigger door for God to work in my life, I needed to go back. I needed to go back to the families that I've hurt and ask their forgiveness. I remember that day I went to a place called Lavender Hill. I knocked on the door and this lady opened. She looked at me and she says, welcome, I was waiting for you. When she said I was waiting for you, I got a little bit scared. <laughs> because if a lady from the Cape Flats says she was waiting for you, it's not good news. She says I was waiting for you. Please come in. As I enter the room, she ushers me into the living room. Her son is sitting. The daughter is somewhere in the kitchen walking up and down. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, I'm in trouble. I'm coming here to ask for forgiveness. It's Mrs. Jones. So let me tell you what happens. So Mr. Jones was working as a correctional officer and in prison, when you work for correctional officer, as, a, as a correctional officer, you stay on the terrain. You stay on the premises, right? And your kids can go to beautiful Model C schools because you get enough money to take them there. But when I did what I did, when I removed the father, when I killed her husband, she lost all of that. She had to be outrooted from that safety and she had to go back to her mother in Lavender Hill, a gang-infested community where her son and daughter had to face the same challenges that I once faced before I went to prison. The devil is a liar. He destroys families. He makes you think that what you do is fair and is right, and you do it because you don't care. As I was standing there and I'm looking at the boy, looking at me, I could see the hurt the pain, the anger in his eyes. The mother looked at me, the mother said, welcome, I had forgiven you because I'm a child of God. I had forgiven you. I knew this day will come that you're going to come here and you're going to ask for forgiveness. I prayed for this day to happen and you are here today. But I do not know how my daughter and my son is going to respond to you. Maybe you should talk to them. The boy said to me, you know what? Every single day when I go to school, I get terrorized. I get bullied. I get called names. They want me to join the gangs and I'm refusing. But for that, I get bullied because of you. My sister barely, barely, barely made matric. She just passed, but she barely made it because of you. You took my family through hell. And now, you're living your life like it's golden. The most important part about forgiveness is the fact that with forgiveness comes accountability. There's no forgiveness without repentance. And when you repent, you take accountability and you action the love that God has given you. It's about taking action. It's about saying, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? I said, God, how do I fix this? 
God says, don't worry. I promise I'll take care of this. Bright Spark Foundation was born. It's an organization that, ha- that helps young people understand and know themselves. When we established this organization, it was built in two areas, Johannesburg and Cape Town. I could not be in two places at the same time. I could not be in Cape Town and Johannesburg at the same time. So Jamie, who's Mr. Jones' daughter, is the managing director of Bright Spark Foundation in Cape Town. We work together. You know, there's this time when I was standing and we were standing in a, in a school hall and we were doing this presentation to these hundreds of kids. I stood next to him and I said, Jamie, how do you feel standing next to the guy that took your father's life? She looks at me and she says, welcome. For the one life that you've taken, you've given back thousands. My father would have been proud of you. This is his legacy. And I love you. That's God's forgiveness. That's God's forgiveness. The fact that she looks at me and the fact that she can walk with me, the fact that the boy finished matric and he's one, he's one of the boys that's mentoring the other boys in soccer, doing wonderful in his life. That's the mercy, the grace, the love of God that operates I'm not here to brag and to stand away from the accountability that I need to take for the lives that I've taken. But God says, in that you are sanctified. I have forgiven you. I've taken the sin that scarred you, that made you red. I've washed you in my blood. You are white. And when you step out of that room and you are standing outside, be a representation of me because that is who you are right now. Where my testimony, my testimony is key to say that God loves us. That God sent his only begotten son for us so that we can have an opportunity to inspire, to build, to grow, to nurture our love for one another. And even at our worst, God still makes us pure. Even in our worst, God still gives us the authority to step on serpents, to pray for the sick, to do miracles every single day with the way that we live our lives. It's not easy, but God comes through for us. I want to say to men that are sitting there today, that no matter where you are in your life, that if God can do to me what he has done to me, imagine what he can do to you. Addiction, how he can save you. Substance abuse, how we can save you. How we can take your life and make it a living testimony. You willingly doing it. Willingly sharing your life with other people and telling them that, yes, I was scarred. As a man, I used to walk around ashamed of what I had done because there was judgment on my life. I used to sit in a church and I felt judged. But God said, don't worry about that. I will vindicate you. I will set you above everything else and make you humble. And you will remember the role that I play in your life every single day. And God has a great sense of humor. God has a great sense of humor. I'm like, God, I, 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 I just thought about it, but I didn't really want it. But thank you. If I had a daughter one day... <laughs> What kind of father am I going to be? And God gave me a daughter. I'm like, yes, like it, not like a daughter. God has a sense of humor. Her name is Sky. She's 10 years old today. And then when I say God has a sense of humor, is that on the 6th of October, 2023, my wife gave birth to another daughter. But don't clap your hands yet, because you haven't heard her name. So I've got Sky, S-K-Y. The one that was born on the 6th is called Storm. (laughs) Storm, amen. Storm, can you believe it? People ask me, where do you get these names? I'm like, yeah, right, it just comes. 
You can't nickname Sky neither can you nickname Storm. And I remember before Storm came, it was storming in Cape Town, it was storming in Joburg, and then she came on the 6th of October. I remember us talking about it when saying that I'm so worried because it's, she's already passed her day since the child's supposed to have been here already. And on that 6th, she came. So I'm a proud father today. And I do the work that I do with young people because I believe that if I had someone that could inspire me to do or to become the man that I am today, I might not have gone to prison. That is why I'm, right, right now I'm that man that needs to inspire other young men not to go there, that they can choose better. They can make better decisions. They can make better life choices. And I'm, and I'm happy to be used as that vessel. I'm happy to say, God, use me every single day as a vessel to progress the work of the gospel because I'm a living testament of God's grace. When people ask me, tell us about God, I say, I am a living testimony of God's grace that God has taken my life and has turned it around to where I'm at today. People ask me, hey, what about the bling? I'm an actor, I'm a star. I went on and played in other movies like Nume Scully, The Forgiven, uh, what's it, Four Corners? I mean, yeah, I mean, Becky's here. All of you know Becky. He's from, uh, he ran away in one of his episodes from his wife. <laughs> but he didn't run away. In real life, he's, he's there. We're not just entertaining the world. We are teaching the world about men to be present, fathers to be available, to be there for your kids, to be there for your daughters, to be there for your sons. We play these roles because we want to be a mirror to you and say that we've made these mistakes as men. We don't want to make you to make the same mistakes that we've made. As men, be there for the ones that you love. Be present for the ones that you love. Be available for the ones that you love. Yes, work will always be there, but your family is more important. God loves a man that loves his family. It is God's principal rule for fathers to be there for their families. And the reason why the world is so messed up is because so many men have stepped out of that role of being fathers. We need to come back, take our rightful place at that dinner table and say, I am home, I am here. Put down that cell phone when we are eating and talk. Have a conversation with our kids. Not just five minutes, but have that conversation. It says, Daddy loves you. Build that relationship. And as I conclude, I really want to say thank you for you guys giving me this opportunity to share my story with you. There's a lot that I cut out of the story. Very gory details. It's like a, a movie. But I wanted to share that with you today, to say that God has taken me from a dark pit and he has put me where I'm at today to share this beautiful story with you. Bright Spark Foundation is a foundation where kids get hope. We are based in Highlands North, just down the road. Beautiful place. And the other day we were organizing a matric dance for a school that has never had one. And through God's grace, we were able to pull it off. And it was amazing. The beautiful things that God does. That we can play fathers in fatherless children's lives. That we can do that every single day. And I'm happy for that. So right now we've got the Q&A. And and I think we're not going to do that. We're going to skip it. Okay, so uh, Wayne says no, no Q&A. Sorry, guys. But I'm always open for Q&A as we conclude after praise and worship. We can meet. Did you have a, I don't know if we're still going to have coffee. You know, we're still going to have coffee. Um, men can't make nice coffee, so I was worried whether the females have left already. <laughs> so if they are still here, then we are happy. Then when we have a cup of coffee, you can ask any questions you want to ask. And we can continue this conversation. But thank you so much, gentlemen, for having me. And praise be to God. Thank you.